All right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the world famous Tipitinas. Thank you so much to Tipitinas for having us or allowing us to use the space. And thank you so much to Tipitinas TV for hosting this. Go ahead and show the logo for Tipitinas TV right now. And thank you again to Nugs.net for using your equipment and show the Nugs.net logo over my shoulder right now. I'm trying to make that so our editing guy is getting cocky. <laughs> oh, so I'm, okay. I'm going to see if he can really do it. I might have my hand up too high. Um, we have a very special guest this evening, uh, someone who I've been watching for a few years, and when she made it to town, it was very thrilling. I think it made a big splash for all the music lovers in New Orleans. Um, if it wasn't already hard enough to get up on stage and shred on a guitar and blow people's hair back, then imagine how hard it must be if you have to do it in a corset and high heels. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please help me introduce Samantha Fish. Hi. Hey. All right. I, I hope is that strange? Like the, the high heels and the corset, whatever no, else. No, like, it's not like a real true corset though. I don't think I could do that. Well, I mean, that that's just it though. Seeing you walk around and stomp on your pedals and everything else with the heels. You know, I with the quarantine and COVID and everything, I, I really haven't worn them much, uh -oh. like in a few months. So <laughs> it was a little weird. Okay. <laughs> Got my sea legs back today though. All right, I feel that's like good. I'm getting it. Yeah. Um, so you are from Kansas City. Yeah, originally that's where I was born and raised, and um, I, I I laid I lived there until just a few years ago, really. Yeah, just yeah. a few years ago, I remember the first time I heard you. I must have been, I think it might have been on you know just one of the Jazz Fest streams. They were you know playing it on OZ, yeah. and it was one of the times I was actually awake during the day since I'm here up all night usually, and. Uh, you know, flip it on on my ride to work and I hear someone shredding it, absolutely shredding on guitar. And it was very much a, who the hell is this? Aww. And then it came and like, oh, you're listening to Samantha Fish on the whatever stage, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, I don't know who that is, but I absolutely need to know who that is from now on. And um, I think that night or the night after, I was at the front door working and sure enough, someone walks up and they say, hey, I'm on the guest list. My name's Samantha Fish. I look up. Oh, yeah, like, I remember oh, that. That was you? Oh, <laughs> man, you killed it today. So that was kind of my informal introduction. So this is the first time I actually get to talk to you a little bit. So yes, I'm very well, excited about thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so when you moved to Kansas City, what was, or moved from Kansas City, what was one of the things that made you think New Orleans needed to be your new home? Well, I, I came to New Orleans probably around like 12 or 13 years old. And I just, I fell in love with the city as a right. kid. Um, and, you know, I just come to a point in my life where I was like, I really was looking for a change. And I kind of tossed around the different, you know, cities and music cities and stuff. And I just, I really, I landed on New Orleans because I, well, I, I had friends here. Uh -huh. um, my manager was close, but the, the real reason is just, I, it felt like the soul move. It just felt like the thing I needed at the time. And like, it, it just, it felt good and it felt right. And I, I don't know, I just, I felt like I'd be at home here. Well, I, I hope you feel at home here because yeah. we're happy to call you a New Orleanian now. So that's yeah, another oh, good thing. Well, I don't know if I've earned it yet, but I, I feel like I've had, I've spent more time here in the last six months. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting to know it, but it, it's a beautiful town, you know, and it's, it's super inspiring as a songwriter. Yeah. You know, there's so much to take in. Um, it's a beautiful city. Well, from Kansas City, you would almost think that more people gravitate towards Chicago or Nashville or Memphis or something like that. So I, I think it's interesting that you came all the way down here. Yeah, I mean, it's I actually I know a lot of people from Kansas City that okay. have come down here. There's like a whole Kansas City contingency of people. Yeah, I, I don't know why it freaked me out. A lady who <laughs> sold me my house is from Kansas City. Wow. So um, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess because it's, you know, it's southernmost town. It's not too far from there. Uh, is it a southern town? I, I I don't know. I mean, it depends. It's a, it's its own town. It's got its own personality. Like there's no other place like New Orleans. So I've, I've I'm not going to call it a southern a city. town. I've never lived in a city that off of I-10. So I, I guess yeah. I've I've always lived in the south. Though. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I consider it a southern city, but it's got its own unique identity. You know. It's, well, it's, tell me a little bit about the music scene there versus a city like New Orleans or Memphis or Nashville. Um. Well, this is all just my perspective, but I mean, growing up in Kansas City, it was all really rooted in, um, there's a long history of jazz and blues. Like, is there? Oh right. yeah, very okay. long tradition of jazz and blues. A um, lot of, uh, and there's a, there's actually a lot going on, music scene wise. There's a lot to do every night. Mm -hmm. You know, for somebody young like myself, when I was coming up as a teenager, I could go to a jam anywhere in the city, any night of the week. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, you know, a lot of blues. Um, there's some cool jazz stuff going on. New Orleans, 
you know, it's just, it's really exciting. Like, normally there's just, there's so much going on. There's an abundance of music. It never yeah. stops. I mean, I hear it, I hear it out, you know, out my window in the street yeah. all the time. Like, it's, it's just alive here constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a place that I think uh, in a couple of different interviews that I've seen you or at least read from you, the Knucklehead Saloon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about that, because uh, I've heard of that place for a lot of years now, and it seems like kind of uh, not the, the Tipitinas of Kansas City or anything like that, but almost just like another one of those places that draws people in like a magnet. Yeah, I mean, you're not, you don't just like happen upon knuckleheads. Mm. It's like, it's in this, um, they, I, I guess they call it the East Bottoms, and it's around all these factories and train yards mm. and everything. So you don't just like go there by accident like passing through you have to specifically be going to knuckleheads okay. to find it right. and it's very it's kind of hard to find but when you get there it's just such a unique place like honestly there's no place like knuckleheads in the world okay it's, it's a really unique venue you know like I, i'd say the same thing about tipitinas it's just yes. there's a soul and a vibe mm-hmm. um and frank down there has built it up um just the last 10 years that I've been going. I mean, it's, I think he's got four stages now, mm-hmm. five stages yeah. in there. It's it's like an amusement park for musicians. <laughs> it's crazy. Well, that sounds great. Yeah. I, well, every every music venue, I don't think a lot of people understand this, but it almost has a life of its own. Definitely. It, it, yeah. it lives, it breathes, it has its own magic in the walls or, or whatever. It's got its own problems. You know, it, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a personality for sure. Uh, I read that you were when you were a little girl, you were playing drums before you ever played guitar, but then made the switch to guitar. Yeah. What was that about? Why Why did you want to switch over to guitar? Um, you know, I I, uh, I just I, I guess I connected with the guitar a little bit easier. I mean, I played drums. I think it was just at that age where I wasn't down with homework and I just wasn't quite disciplined enough to to practice as much as I should. And I think I always felt relegated to my dark, scary basement um, to play drums because that's the only place I was allowed to play drums. Um, you know, when I picked up the guitar, I started playing and singing at the same time and I was learning chords and singing songs. I think I always secretly wanted to be in the front of the band, okay. but I was just very shy. Um, I mean, I still love the drums. I think everybody should learn how to play drums when they're getting into music because it gives you that that innate rhythm yeah. that, I mean, I, I... I'm grateful that I, I had that education before I started the guitar. Well, and you didn't sing until you started playing guitar? No. Wow. Yeah, I was just, I'm super shy. I don't know. Well, are, your sister's a musician as well, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Do you have any other musicians in the family? Or was this something that you were basically handed early on? Like, hey, you should really take an interest in this? Or did you do it on your own completely? I mean, I found it on my own, okay. but it was always around. Like, my dad played guitar. So, mm. I mean, he had guitars lying around. Um, all of his... All my uncles played guitar, like they were shredders, you know, Whoa. metal stuff, yeah. rock and roll. And um, then my dad's friends were all into like bluegrass and West, like a right. West Coast swing and country and everything. So I, you know, I'd watch them kind of play together. My mom sang in church. Um, all of my aunts can sing really well. I mean, it's just, it's always been around, all right. but never like professionally. And, you know, so when I, I started kind of getting after, it just seemed like the thing to do. Cool. The music that you were listening to earliest um, was it was rock and roll, I assume, or yeah. were, were you into people? Well, let me ask you a better question. I feel like more people categorize you as blues or a blues musician. And when I hear and see your music, I hear blues influence, but I would just say almost straight rock and roll or Southern rock. I, I wouldn't specifically call you a blues musician. Do you, do you yeah. defy that? Your genre at all or is it something you welcome tell me a little bit about that I mean I think the blues is it's in everything that I play mm-hmm. you know it's everything I do kind of has that feel to it you know I call it the blues or just call it like my own personal thing that I okay. do um, but when I started getting into music I just listened to the radio and it was like what do you listen to when you like guitar Mm -hmm. it's like there's classic rock radio it's either country or classic rock or you know i'm trying to think like any other stations might have some cool guitar but it's all like you know i was into boston and uh (laughs) you know uh like i really like mike campbell from tom petty and the heartbreakers some of the most epic riffs you know that under underrated in a lot of ways you know led zeppelin rolling stones keith richards i mean you can't get any Mm. better so really that was my introduction to like guitar music and what did they listen to they listen to blues. So that, go, I that's that how I, sense. you know, I, I'm one of those people who I kind of like to know who taught, you know, when I'm, when I'm learning like Keith Richards licks, I'm like, well, who taught him, you know, like, where did he learn this? And I, yeah. you just kind of fall down this rabbit hole of information. And 
I found the blues that way, and Kansas City was really a bluesy town. Yeah. Just kind of all fell so. together. Hmm. Interesting. Tell me about the step into being a professional musician, from just playing as a in high school to making the step forward and playing in front of an audience. Um, I was still in high school. Okay. The first time I ever got on stage and played in front of anybody. And I, I didn't... I don't know. I, I kind of come from like a practical thinking Midwestern background where, you know, wanting to do music professionally, it's like, oh, that's cool. But what's your backup plan? Yeah, what it's are like, you really going to yeah, do? Yeah, what are you going to yeah. do? Um, and I don't know. I just didn't really, I didn't have the vision for it at that point, you know. But I remember playing first time in front of people. I kind of got thrust into this situation. at a. It was like an outdoor party. And this guy had this cool Chet Atkins Gibson guitar. His name was Greg Camp. I have the guitar now because okay. he became a mentor <laughs> to me. Um, but yeah, he's like, yeah, plug it in, play. And, cool. it, and he just kind of threw me up on stage. I probably never would have gotten up there if I'd had any time to process it because I was really like terrified of that whole thing. Oh, man. I was shaking and I played, but I remember it being like a terrible yet exhilarating experience and I wanted to do it again. I was like, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna play music. I'm gonna well, be Well, you're a self-admittedly a shy girl, so. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm surprised that you would have even gone for it. I guess he just caught you by surprise. He caught me off guard and caught me on the right day. And I, I just caught the bug, you know, it was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Well, then what happened next? Oh, yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> the, the important part. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to really know how to create. Because really, at the end of the day, you're creating a business for uh -huh. yourself. You know, that's how you do it. Like professionally, it's like I got to figure out how to make this my full time you know, life's work, my career. I, you know, it was just like one foot in front of the other. I, I put a band together, and, so, and this took a couple years. You know, I'd go out and jam with people, and I graduated high school and all that. But when I became like, I hit like 20 or something, I put a band together, and it sounds stupid, but I remember sitting down like at the table with the phone book and calling every single bar and restaurant, being like soliciting them for money. <laughs> <laughs> you want to you want to hire me? You want to pay me uh, you know, a few hundred dollars? Uh, it was um, shameless, but it worked. And well, it's, that's not shameless. My... That's what people do when they're. Did you? Here's here's the funny thing. Did you pretend to be your manager? I've like, never done that. You gotta be kidding me. I've never done that. I know, and I'm like, I should do that. And emails. I I'm just such a bad faker. I'd probably like crack myself up on a call. I. I... Not to tell any personal stories, but I, I do know many people who, when they're starting out and they don't have yeah. a manager or a booking agent, they're, you know, Steven Stevenson or whoever else, like they call on behalf of this band that they're representing yeah. and here, let me send you a demo or whatever else. It is really hard, especially when you're young, to try and like, you know, establish your worth mm. and then ask for it. And, yeah, and yeah. everybody wants to like, you know, so I'd always double my price and then I'd know they'd work down to like mm -hmm. a comfortable range. But I mean, I got turned down a lot, um, but eventually it's like, you know, we'd have some solid shows on the calendar. Like I'd have a couple weekly gigs and I'd just start building off of that. Mm -hmm. And before I knew it, I'd have like a six month calendar. And then, you know, you do well here and then somebody else hears about you. It's just like word of mouth. Um, it, it takes a lot of time though, at least the way I did it. Very grassroots. Well, you say it takes a lot of time, but here we are 10, 12 years later or something like that, and you are selling out major venues around the globe. It's so, worth it. It's so, totally yeah, worth it. The say, shameless uh, phone book game is totally worth it. That's, that's how it's done. That's how it's <laughs> yeah, done. Yeah, it is how it's done. And you're kind of in the, the world of, it was, I mean, it's funny that you say you're doing this over the phone when even working here, I can attest to very many people just email. Like they just email, they don't follow up, don't do anything else. Yeah. And it, not that it's they're being lazy or something like that, but you're 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 curbing yourself by just sending an email and assuming that clicking this will get me work. But it's really hard to know like the balance between am I pursuing them too much? Mm -hmm. Is it getting weird? Uh, should I pull back? <laughs> it's like dating, you know. I guess. Trying to book your own gigs. I don't know. Um, I haven't dated in a long time. <laughs> But I'm told there's an app for it now, so I don't know. They've got lots of apps. <laughs> I don't trust them. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your first out-of-town gigs. How long did it take before you were booking gigs out of Kansas City? Um, I had my first uh, run. I went to Chicago. Okay. And I had a, a couple Kansas City dates. I played in Columbia. I went to um, St. Louis. Then we played up somewhere in, like, Chillicothe or Peoria or something, Illinois, and then we had Chicago for two nights or three really? nights. Um, 
and tough gigs. <sighs> It, it was it was a rough tour. We were supposed to be a part of like this um, blues caravan from Kansas City where a bunch of bands were going to go and do right. the show and everybody dropped out except for us. What? And the lady who put it together is really, really sweet, but she didn't let any of the venues know that this big 15 band, you know, person production is now just a trio. So uh, it's just me showing up at the time, not knowing anything like, hey, I'm actually going to be playing your show night. So they started feeling like ripped off. You know, the money started falling apart. And, yeah. It was a mess. I remember driving home from Chicago and like crying because it was just, it was a rough tour, but I mean, I met, I got to play at this place called Rose's Lounge up in Chicago, which mm -hmm. is just a legendary spot. And I've gotten to go back. I mean, I, I went back maybe four or five times, right. you know, to build my Chicago following there and, and then it just blossomed, you know? No, so I, it's I, worth it. It just. Yeah, no, it's worth it. Those nightmare gigs are what make you into the musician you become. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, how long did it take before you ended up getting signed by a real label? Um, this is where it gets kind of muddy for me because I feel like I was, you know, I was working uh, for a while, but I was also going to Knuckleheads, like even on nights off, if I didn't have a show, I'd go and check out who was playing in Knuckleheads. And a lot of times, you know, the sound guy there was really sweet. His name was Pete Sager. And he'd be like, hey, do you mind if this girl comes up and plays with you? So... I like, he was soliciting you for the, the <laughs> bands that were playing. Yeah. All right. Pete and Frank both did that. And I met a lot of cool people that way. And like? I met this guy named Mike Zito, who then, uh, you know, he'd come through town quite often. I'd play with him. And after like a year or two of cultivating this just friendship, he's like, hey, they're looking for a third girl on this uh, German label. They're putting together this uh, group for a blues caravan called Girls with Guitars. And another I think, caravan? Yeah, another caravan. <laughs> of course, I'm like, nightmare, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Um, but it was called Girls with Guitars, which kind of freaked me out too, because, eh. But um, it it's, turned out to be a really good opportunity. Okay. Yeah. It sounds, I mean, when you hear that, like, like you said, eh, like, Girls with it's Guitars, on the like, nose. are you trying to get, like, a <laughs> shtick going? Like, well, like take I, me seriously, don't, don't. That's what I was really worried about, and I, I remember voicing my concerns and talking to like my friend Mike and he said, dude, this is this is such a good opportunity for you. Go do this, go knock it out, go and, you know, be empowered, you know, empowered and, and inspire people. And, and I think that's what we really, you know, were striving for at the end of the day. The other girls on the tour were Cassie Taylor and Danny Wilde and they were incredibly talented. And we, we had a lot of fun. It only lasted a year. Um, okay. So well, at that, that, that was point, a whole year of touring, though, huh? Yeah, I mean, we I went from playing Kansas City and regional gigs to now we're going to go play in Germany and, at a sold out venue. Well, Danny Wilde is British, isn't yeah, she? She's I a Brit. Like I don't know how I know that, but I yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's British. Cassie Cassie's from the U.S. Um, but was that like the foray into the first European shows, like yeah. having a someone from Europe taking you to Europe? Well, Thomas Roof. Um, of Roof Records puts together Blues Caravan every year. Okay. And it's of solo artists on his um, his roster, basically. Right. It puts together three solo artists and they go out and like, you know, as a group and it's a well-attended tour, you know, as far as ticket sales, um, you know, and it's very collaborative, but we're all like independently trying to showcase ourselves as, yeah. as you know, solo artists and everything. So he signed me after I made the record with them and that's kind of like where things started taking off for me. All right. What did you get to form, you know, your own band that could help split off that? Or? Yeah. I mean, I had my own band out of Kansas city. Mm -hmm. Um, and I played with the, I kind of like did both for a while mm -hmm. and then the girls with guitars ended and I went back to touring with my band and the booking agency that had picked up girls with guitars us picked me up. All right. And so they started booking us more, I mean, I was still playing locally and regionally a lot, but they were starting to, you know, put these tours together. So I was going to Florida. Oh. I was going to the East Coast for the first time and playing in a, on the West Coast. You mentioned Mike Zito. Uh, sorry to jump back to that. And I, I feel like I read something somewhere before where you said he has been kind of a mentor. And he was in Royal, is in Royal Southern Brotherhood, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, he, he's a, a killer. Tell, yeah. tell me a little bit about any type of mentorship or anything that you've learned from him specifically. Well... It's a, it's such a long story, you know, like from the time that I met him, it's funny, the people that you meet, you don't ever, like when you're young, you're like, you, you don't really know how, what, what kind of role people are going to play in your life. Um, and Mike 
Mike was a, a big mentor for me. He produced my first two albums on right. Roof. He produced the Girls With Guitars record. So, you know, we kind of had that relationship. And then when he joined the Royal Southern Brotherhood, it's kind of, in a way, how I met my manager, Ruben. Okay. Um, because Ruben was managing... Yeah, the Royal Southern my, Brotherhood. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they put me out. Uh, my second album with Roof, um, Charlie... Charlie Wooten and Yanrico Scott came and played All in the right. rhythm section. They were the rhythm section of RSB. Mike produced it. So we went to Europe for like five weeks where I opened for them. And yeah. Well, Europe keeps coming up. Um, oh, yeah. So I want to ask you a little bit about Europe. I hear all kinds of stories from American musicians saying how great it is to tour Europe. What, yeah. What is it about the European audience that is so much more welcoming to American music? Why, why does it seem like even New Orleans bands specifically have so much more monetary success in Europe? What do you think that is about the difference in people? Well, they're hardcore music fans okay. in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it's exotic, you know? It's like, like here's, here's an American band coming over playing blues or rock and roll, and it's like this exotic thing. Um, just there, there's been a love affair with you know Europe and American musicians and American music for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think they're just really uh, some of the best, most dedicated fans. Mm. Really, I can't I can't really boil it down to anything more than I just I think they're just true fans of like American art and music. Oh, I'm not looking for any kind of like I, sociological theory on what the difference is between. I tried to figure it out. <laughs> I tried to figure it out, but it's um. They're just really supportive mm -hmm. and, and diehards, for sure. That's interesting. Yeah. You've uh, recorded a number of cover songs before, and I'm wondering if there's anything specific about the artist that you like to cover. Uh, if it's something, do you have a favorite, or is there just something that you feel you hear a song and say, how come this song isn't as big as it is, or I love this song and I want to put my own spin on it? Yeah. Um, you know, when I go to, like, pick a cool classic rock cover or something, we sort of started doing War Pigs as like a joke. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it got a little viral sensation going well, on. Because we were playing all these blues festivals and people were complaining that we weren't bluesy enough. We were too <laughs> rock. And so I'm like, hey, Black Sabbath wanted to be a blues band. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what they started as was a blues band. So I'm like, let's it'd just be hilarious if we like go to these blues festivals and play War Pigs. And yeah, half the people were like, you know, devil horns, loving it. And then some people were like, that's not blues. But, you know, to me, it's just... Like those are those guys in particular. It's like they they had a great love for the genre, mm. and then it, and it kind of painted everything they did. Mm -hmm. You know, even if even at the other day you get war pigs, but um, when war I war pigs kicks ass. I don't give a give a damn who says otherwise. Well, when I choose yeah. a song, I'm like, if it's not one of my own, I want it to be epic, and mm. and so I, I kind of you know always try and get something that might surprise people. I mean, we've had some cover fails that yeah. didn't work out. Like. I was like into Primus for a while and tried to do that. And I was like, I mean, just, if you get the right bass player, yeah, Primus yeah. is exactly what everyone needs. No, I, I, that's what I was thinking. I, oh, I think sorry, we were going to do the damn blue collared tweakers, and I was like it's really classic. excited about it. It was just a lot to pull off to sing, you know, I mean, less plays and sings, and mm. I'd be playing guitar and singing. It was just a lot of different things going on. I We didn't. We didn't dedicate the near enough uh, the time that we should have to it. And honestly, it might make a comeback. Who knows? Well, I'm a huge fan. You have a lot of time on your hands. Maybe it's time to start throwing in those old Primus CDs. Yeah. And take a listen and see what you can pull off. I mean, that's that's a good one. It's all on the bass player. I think at that even a, a more Southern rock bluesy version of like Southbound Pachyderm would be yeah, really cool. Yeah, oh like, God, that'd be great. That'd be pretty awesome. My music taste is kind of all over the map, you know. I, I So I like to kind of pick a cover that might surprise people and like oh hey look we can apply it in this sense and, mm -hmm. and uh it all works it all works it's just music well i was gonna wait till later on but what are some of your uh musical guilty pleasures that might surprise people or that maybe you're too embarrassed to admit oh and God. you're gonna have to admit now and again primus doesn't count because they're <laughs> Les Claypool is a god, and I won't let yeah, anyone no, say anything otherwise. Yeah, no, that's not a guilty otherwise. pleasure. That's yeah. like that's like a you know roll the windows down and turn it up to ten. Mm -hmm. That's to eleven, maybe. Yeah, but, yeah. Let me think, because um, I'm not really embarrassed about any of the stuff I like. Uh, it's just it's all it's all across the board. It's all over the map. I mean, I I listen to the pop. Am I allowed to cuss on this thing? Yeah, yeah. I say listen to pop. Whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of like, oh God, I love like, I love some of these new uh, chicks who are coming out. Like, I love Lady Gaga. I love uh, Billie Eilish. You know, I think um, 
what WAP's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> we, it's fun. That's for it's sure. It's fun. It's just you know that's the thing. Music is supposed to be fun, and I think sometimes mm-hmm. we end up taking it a little too seriously. And it's it's art, and it's it's just a creative release. And I I don't know. I mean I I, I think I think um, you know I just I like to dabble all over the board. I listen to a lot of different. <laughs> Well, we'll keep the WAP in mind for sure. Um, let's let's talk about... It's not about... my top 10 or anything, but, you know, it's okay. It's all right, I guess. I like it. Um, it's, it's definitely dating this interview for anyone who it might be watching this down the road. It definitely is dating it. Well, you're like, that's surprise that, that, me. I'm that's, like, that's, WAP. that's a hot song the past couple of weeks for sure. Um, <laughs> your own record label, Wild Heart Records. Yes. Um, and was it... Ruben, your manager, that convinced you that maybe it's time to take a stab at this? He convinces me to do a lot of things. Um, <laughs> Just like this interview, I'm sure. Well, I I always tell him things I want to do. Okay. And then he tries to make it happen for me. And then I try to say, I don't think I have time to do this. And then he's like, you're going to do it. Okay. You have time. You're going to make it happen. But I wanted to produce records. And I told him, I want to I want to try production. <laughs> and then he's like, you're going to produce Jonathan Long's album. And at first I was like really stressed about it because... It kind of came up quickly. Um, I was doing a lot of touring and I was, you know, really stressed about life and whatever. And yeah, so he 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 sent me to do it and God, I had so much fun. And well, Jonathan Long is so good already. Like that must be kind of a relief that yeah. how like you're, you're producing this, oh. but you don't have to give him that much input because he a lot knows... of my job was just to let him do it. Yeah, thing. but that's what a good producer would do, right? I hope. <laughs> well, if you recognize a talent like that, for sure. Yeah, I mean, he's, he really knows uh, which way he wants to go. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I, the only thing I would try and do is, like, you know, add little effects in here, here and there to just fill out the song and make it, uh, you know, unique. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just get his message across. Whatever he wants that to be, that's my job, is to make sure he's heard the way he wants to be heard. Um, but as far as the company goes, yeah, We were going to, I did the album for Jonathan and when we finished it, it was like, Hey, you know, why don't we just start this company that we've been talking about starting for a long time and, and just, and do it and rip the bandaid off. So yeah. Wild heart records. What, uh, what do you think are some of the biggest hurdles that you face as a label? Uh, I mean, it's, it's funny. It's, it's all a struggle. It's, it's, it's a great it's a great thing I like being a part of a team but there's just I'm starting to realize the times that I would get pissed off at my label because it's like I want this record to come out at this time and they're like oh we can't because of this and that you know like you have to make some difficult decisions that you know as an artist I'm usually like oh I'd be so against this right now but now I'm starting to understand from the other side (laughs) why it makes sense I'm like oh I'm like the devil I'm the devil you know. Well, I don't think you're the devil. I think our, our owners here at Tipitina's Galactic probably got the same dose when they bought it. Like, everyone talks about, man, if I had my own venue. Yeah. And now that they have their own venue, it's like, oh, crap, this is a lot harder than we thought it would be. <laughs> All your friends want free drinks and free tickets. It's like, oh, man, I got to tighten up. Yeah. Like, um, it's, it's it's rough. It's, it's definitely, you know, it's probably not biting off more than you can chew, but definitely well, it's become a bigger a, bite than you thought you'd have to take. It's eye-opening. Yeah. Um, and honestly, it's probably helped me in my relationship with, you know, my current projects now, you know, because it's like you just, you sort of recognize the other perspective and, um, you know, know which fights to fight. <laughs> well, you, you definitely get to help not just, you know, shape the industry, but on a more personal level, shape handfuls of musicians to help build your own little nook in the industry a little bit. I'm trying. I'm trying. I, no, it's, I mean, I it's an honor. It. It's an honor to get to be a part of somebody's team like that, you know, for them mm. to trust you. And, you know, that's it's a lot of pressure, but it's it's a it's an honor, you know, to get to work with artists like mm-hmm. that. Uh, tell me a little bit about when not that you were doing dives all the time, but when it went from bar rooms and saloons to all of a sudden I'm playing in front of a couple thousand people headlining. What was, was there a moment? Was there a thing that you think was the the true stepping stone for that? It's always been really hard for me because I'm, I I just don't let up from working. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to like lift my head up and see exactly, you know, oh, when, when things changed, Mm -hmm. because it happens gradually. It doesn't, I don't feel like it happens unless you have a major radio success hit, mm. it probably just doesn't cha- like change all at once. You know, we were still like kind of, 
you know, we'd sprinkle in a really cool venue here and there. And, you know, and I still love playing dives or cool. small bars. I mean, it's all it's all about the vibe. Um, I've, I noticed in the last probably 2017, okay. around the time I moved here. Yeah, I was going to say, it might have been around the time you came to New yeah. Orleans because I remember all of a sudden you were playing locally and then it was like, but she can't play because she's going on a big tour playing much bigger rooms. Sorry. <laughs> well, we, I think my first gig in New Orleans ever was at the Maple Leaf. Uh-huh. And... Yeah, and I, I, of course, I'm like... I love this. It's basically, you know, no offense, it's one of the only other places in New Orleans I go and see music besides yeah. here. So. Yeah, no, it was... I, I kind of just didn't know the history of the room, you mm. know, and so later on I'm finding out, like, wow, that was my first gig in New Orleans? Oh, my <laughs> God! I'm like, I'm, you know, clueless, apparently. Mm. And then we played at the DBA, um, and and then, yeah, it was... Uh, we we, we kind of... we pulled back. I mean, we just, I've been on the road for so long. I, I knew when I moved to a new place, I was never going to really quite get like the local hometown schedule that I had when I was in Kansas City, because I'd already stopped doing that there. Well, I'd you'd, you'd already fully... outgrown it by the time you come here, basically. You were, you were a touring musician. You weren't yeah. just a local, mu- you know, not that you're not a local musician, but you're not playing multiple nights per week at home, in your hometown. Yeah. You're not just driving to your gig and going home. Yeah, yeah. You're hitting exactly. the road for weeks at a time. So. And I kind of always just, I, I like doing the touring. I, I, I love doing, uh, you know, I like touring. I think for my business and what I'm doing, it's it's like, it's helped in my growth to, mm-hmm. do, to do it that way. But I noticed a shift somewhere in 2017. We came out with two albums in one year, mm-hmm. and that was kind of like, uh you know, interesting, and and I really focused on kind of taking a, a left turn with the aesthetic and the music. We we doubled the size of the band, mm-hmm. and people started to notice, and it was like it became like a hype thing. Like, oh wow, it's like let's go check her out. You know, I don't know if different. it was hype. I mean, it was real, and not to mention like I don't, I don't mean know if hype you can like see a bad word. List. I mean, it, like, are, I think it's a good word. These are just the basic awards on your Wikipedia page that I copied and pasted, oh, and wow. it was half a damn page of. 24 awards and I know for a fact that it's not all of them but I mean best guitarist best artist road warrior best stage performance you know best modern roots cd best <laughs> blues album best independent blues like it goes on and on and on and Jeez. on and it's been going on like this for the past eight years just getting multiple multiple awards all the time so it's being noticed that's yeah. for sure and it's been noticed but I think just in general the rest of the world caught up yeah, and well, started noticing. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. And I, I don't mean hype in a bad as a bad word. I mean, uh oh, <laughs> I lost my note. Yeah, sorry, it's we're okay. all good. We're all good. I don't mean it as like a bad word. I just, um, you know, there's an excitement. You know, mm. um, I I'd been doing this long enough, where it was just incremental, really kind of small growth, and mm. then to to see it like, you know, not just jump up like. 15 tickets one night but jump up like 500 tickets mm-hmm. it's like oh okay something is something's happening yeah um but still i mean I, I don't really pick my head up very often which i probably should did you start wild heart records after 2017 yep okay. i think that happened in 2018 so you put out two albums in one year and then it's basically time hey we need to you know tighten the reins and really get a hold of this situation let's <laughs> Let's do this on our own. And then last year, you put out your sixth studio album, Killer Be Kind. Yeah, and actually, I'd, I um, I finished my contract with Roof. We, we'd done like five solo albums together and then two collaborative. And actually, I'm, I'm not on Wild Heart Records. I'm... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I totally I mean, I would be. That. I'd hate to have to be my own, <laughs> you, like, yeah, my safe. own label. I'd be fighting with myself. It'd be brutal. Um, brutal. At least to get everything you asked for, though. <laughs> Maybe not though. That's true. You might, you might, yeah, kick yourself to the <laughs> curb a little bit. <laughs> I'd be the, I'd be so mean to me. Um, no, we signed with Rounder Records uh, for Killer Be Kind. Okay. And started that relationship. I mean, they're yeah. a good record label. They they're represent great. a lot of, a lot of great musicians. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, sure. Tell me about some of the people that you've been able to collaborate with in studio. Oh, God. Um, well, I just coll- well, I, we haven't collaborated in the studio, but I just co-wrote a song with Keb Mo. I'm hoping that does something. Cool. Really? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, Luther Dickinson produced an album, two yeah. albums for me. Oh, d- Luther Dickinson is a he's a god among men. I love him he dearly. Is. Uh, I love his brother, and you know, obviously, great, great musician. For that Bell of the West record, that was probably like one of the coolest sessions I think I've ever been on. Yeah. Um, Where did you record that? 
That was at a, the Zebra Ranch in Hernando, Mississippi, I think is the okay. city. But um, yeah, Luther produced it. Light and Malcolm played. Mm. Jimbo Mathis is on like the Fender Rose. Nice. Um, Amy LeVere played upright bass. Yeah. TK from Southern Avenue uh, was on the oh, drums. Yeah. Shardy mm. Thomas on that drum and fife. And then, um, oh yeah, Lily May. Like right. fiddle. Are you familiar with her? I am not, she's but I'll amazing. pretend like I am. No, she's amazing. Okay. She good. was in Jack White's band, but she's got this solo career and her voice is incredible and very right. distinct. And I mean, that was just such a cool session. I I think I was digging on all like the female voices in the room because mm. they were all incredible singers and the harmonies were just like mind blowing. But um, I just collaborated with Dion. Okay. The Wanderer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. it's, it, well. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Who, who else is out there that you still want to collaborate with? Oh. Um, and are you, you said you've been writing a lot. Like, uh, is is there another album in the works right now? And are you yeah. trying to pull people in for that currently? Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, it's like, we got to do something with the time we've been given. Mm -hmm. And so I've been writing and prepping for the next record, just trying to get as prepared as possible. Usually, like... I write everything while I'm on while I'm on tour, and it's like I'm trying to do everything at once. So this is the first time I've ever been able to just go, all right, you know, now I'm just gonna slow down and write. Mm -hmm. Better write something good. Is it changing the sound that you think that you're gonna put out? Um, I think the sound was gonna change no matter what. All right. Um, it it always does. Yeah, it yeah. always does. Yeah. I I like to experiment. I like to kind of push the boundaries a little bit of what you know what I've been doing in the past and, you know, just try to grow. The idea is to write the best song that you can, you know, something mm -hmm. that's catchy and, you know, really catches people. So all I'm trying to do is mm -hmm. focus on writing the best songs possible. I mean, I, I, I like that attitude at least. Again, like I said uh, earlier, you're not a straight blues musician. You're not a straight rock and roll musician. Like music is an art. Art's a living, breathing thing. And, you know, art's not safe. So push that boundary and, yeah. and see how far you can take it. Um, you've released a handful of very enjoyable music videos as well in the past couple of years. Tell me a little bit about, <laughs> uh, do, do you like making music videos? Is I it a lot it. of work that you didn't think you'd have to put in? Or tell me. Tell I me. love making music videos. It's so much fun. It's the opportunity to... You know, you wrote, you wrote the song, you had your own story or experience or vision in mind when you wrote it, but everybody interprets it their own way. Mm -hmm. The video is the opportunity to go one step further and really just like fully imagine the song. Yeah. You know, now we've got the story, the visual story to go with it. So mm -hmm. I, I love doing music videos. I think it's really creative. It gives me the opportunity to, you know, stretch out from here I am on the stage to now here I am, you know, I, I don't know. It's like acting or, you know, just being a person. Well, now that you've got a couple in the can, do you, do you write music ever with that in mind? Is it changing the way you're writing songs? Like, <laughs> man, I can't wait to make a video for this song while you're writing it. <laughs> yeah, Has that I mean, come up yet? I usually finish the song and I demo it out on my garage band. Then I can like, then I can visualize the video. Um, yeah, it probably annoys the hell out of. Ruben, my manager, because I'm like, oh, I, I've got the video already. It's like, we haven't even recorded the song. You know, <laughs> you don't have the video yet. But yeah, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I hear music like that. You know, I, I kind of see a storyboard, a storyboard. It's like a fully imagined thing. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, tell me a little bit about the aptly named the Samantha Fish Guitar Box Festival. You got your own festival with yep. your name on it which is awesome. And it was the very first one last year. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, to be fair, they have been doing that for, I think it was their fifth year. There's, there's been a festival like that on and off for sure in the area. Yeah. I, per, I performed at it for two years before um, mm -hmm. we partnered with them. Um, Collins Kirby and his crew and their team that uh, puts the festival on. He had me come in, I guess it was probably 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 2018. And um, they were doing it at the Frenchman Theater then. Mm. And it was just really cool. And honestly, we had a video go viral from that festival. I'd kind of just like put together a band just for that because my band is scattered all throughout. You know, my my drummer at the time was like in Detroit, my bass mm -hmm. players in Austin. So I just threw something together. And some cell phone video went viral from it. Mm. And it, it was kind of cool. So we went back the next year and played it. And that's when Collins approached us and said, what if we just did this and like, you know, joined together? And, 
again, one of those things where I was like, I don't think I have time. And Ruben's like, you have time. You're going to do it. And it's going to be awesome. And it, it was really great last year. Well, it was a great success. I think it might have sold out all three days. With three days, right? Was yeah, it, days? Uh, it was it was close. I, I man, I'm the worst to ask for this. Um, <laughs> well, you did it at it was at Chicky Wawa and at the Howlin' Wolf. Yeah, we did and two and nights remember, at Chicky and yeah, two nights at Howlin' Wolf. I talked to Howie at the Wolf and he said it was a massive success. Good. So. Good. Um, they they were thrilled with it. Everyone that went obviously loved it. And it's not it's there's lessons. There's uh, speakers. Like tell me a little bit about the festival itself. The festival, um, well, it it celebrates everything cigar box guitar. It's not limited just to that, but you know, really, that's the spirit of it. Mm. There we welcome all kinds of builders, people, you know, with great imaginations that build their own instruments. Not just cigar box. I mean, we had a guy make a bass out of like a boat oar or something. Yeah, the, the musician lineup was not all cigar box guitar players. Yeah. I mean, Monk Boudreaux was on the bill. There, there was plenty of other people who played electric guitars and everything yeah. else. But it's the spirit of it, you know, this kind of homemade instrument mm. uh, phenomenon. There's a huge um, community of people that love cigar box guitars. Yes. The Facebook forum is nuts. Is it? I, I stay out of it. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, they, they really, uh, they've got a, a, a passion for it. So, you know, just this festival, that idea. Um, we ha we host like workshops, mm -hmm. um, and then you know my my job, you know, because I played it every night, like coming up with a creative show to play and mm -hmm. how to showcase different musicians and you know just do a different show, something completely unique that nobody's ever going to get to see again, yeah. hasn't been seen before. Mm -hmm. um, you know that was really fun for me personally, but yeah, the the festival, it's it's attended by people who have. A love and enthusiasm for guitar, but also, you know, rock and roll, blues, mm. just hardcore fans of the genre. How did you first get into it? I, I definitely read something before that said you were playing a festival maybe in Arkansas and you happened to see someone selling them on the sidewalk and you heard someone play one later that day. And then when you went back again the next time, it was like, oh, yeah, I'm getting one this yeah. time. Well, my first festival when I was 17 years old. My dad took me and my sister down to King Biscuit Blues Festival okay. in Helena, Arkansas. And they've got a main stage and that's great, but what's really cool is they've got this midway where, you know, they got food vendors and artists and stuff, yeah. but people are playing on the street. And I kept seeing like these bands utilizing these cool guitars, like Richard Johnson was one of them. I think Moreland and Arbuckle. And um, I was like, wow, that's just such a weird sounding, guttural, like raw, really cool instrument. And mm -hmm. you, they had them set up in like a variety of different ways. And I think it was a chance. I was excited about it. And then, you know, I went home. Years later, they hired me to play the festival, maybe like six, seven years later. Uh -huh. I saw a guy selling them on the street and I bought it and plugged it in. And the fans just loved it. It's I don't know. It's become a signature of your performances now. I never anticipated that people would, <laughs> you know, force me to play that every night. Because if I don't play it, people get mad. Well, are there um, any other instruments that you've considered taking up kind of in the same vein that have intrigued you? And oh, yeah. Maybe I can handle that. Maybe I can't. Well, I don't know if I can handle it, but I, I have a pedal steel at home because I am in love with pedal steel guitar. All right. Yeah, just there's something about it. It's it's so emotional and beautiful. But it, learning to play one's like, I don't know, it's like learning to fly a helicopter. It's really complicated. Yeah. It's really complicated. But you get to sit, so that's nice. I feel like I have to go get a degree and then You sit don't down have to. I, we we will, I will hook you up with Ed from the Revivalist. He's, oh, yeah. I he's know a him. friend of the program. Oh, yeah. He probably lives in your neighborhood, he, actually. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, I've actually talked to him about this very thing, and it's like, yeah, maybe if we ever get some time off the road. Well, but, I'll tell you what. I'm pretty sure he lives in your neighborhood. Um, we'll set you guys up, and he can start giving you lessons in the backyard <laughs> or something like that. Oh, I'd uh, love that, man. He's, oh. he's phenomenal. And he's one of those people that, you know, after talking to him and after just watching anyone that's proficient at pedal steel, like, that thing can sing, you know? Oh, it's, yeah. It, it takes on a voice and it can do so many different things that you wouldn't think so uh, as a novice. But then when you watch someone who knows what they're doing with it. Oh, it's incredible. It's, it's one of the most powerful instruments you can play. No, and honestly, like Ed, he does mm -hmm. that so effortlessly. Mm -hmm. he, and I sit down with it and it's like, Oh my God! I I don't even know how many levers you can possibly move under here, and it, it's just it's it's a lot. But I know there's a huge learning curve to it. He's he's one of the best. All right. Well, Ed, if you're listening, she lives she lives in your neck of the woods. I we'll bet. set you guys up, give her lessons, or sit in. At least that would be awesome. Seeing Ed play with you guys. Oh yeah, be phenomenal. As well. I'm down with a sit in too. 
Um, you've, you've been super generous, and I know it's been a long day for you, so we'll start getting towards the end of this. There's yes. something that we do with everyone. Not something that we do. Something that we ask everyone that's on the program. Um, since you are somewhat new to New Orleans, you obviously understand how important po' boys are to our oh, culture yeah. here. Um, I want to ask you if there's a special place in your heart that is your favorite po' boy, and more specifically, this is this all comes from, let me back it up to give a shout out appropriately to uh, guys po' boys in the neighborhood. They're, uh, they're our go-to po' boy stop, or po' boy shop, and they're dear friends of the guys of Galactic. Galactic used to live across oh, cool. the street from them. Marvin, who runs guys, used to hook them up with food, ended up naming a po' boy for Stanton called The Bomb. Um, is there a Samantha? Tell me, <laughs> tell me. If there's a place that you go to that's like, this is my neighborhood spot, or I drive across town because this one's so good. But then if you were to create your very own, exactly what would it be? Um, well, this is this is a sore subject for me because right when I moved to New Orleans, I found out I was allergic to shellfish. So okay. I, can't, I can't do like... An, there's, a, a lot. <laughs> there's plenty of good non shellfish. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, shrimp, oysters, and you know, soft shell crab. Those those are some of the biggest, yeah. obviously. Oh yeah. But there um, are plenty of awesome po' boys that do not have any shellfish. Yeah, there there are. I mean, I I wish I was more of a connoisseur. I mean, I, I dig the Fiorellas because it's close to me. Okay. Um, what do you get from there? Uh, I, I like catfish. I like uh, the not, hot. Not a shellfish. That's safe. Yeah. The, the sausage po' boys are pretty good. Right. Hot but, sausage or smoked. Um, it depends on my mood. Okay. I kind of, I like the links. Uh, I, pr I probably prefer like, you know, hot sausage, but I'm not really a patty fan. Mm. I don't know. It's weird to me. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Fiorella's is really good. I wish I, I, I probably was a little deterred from trying all the cool, like legendary po' boy spots just because I felt a little burnt that, <laughs> that, that you're missing I could out the, on a whole I, section of food. I couldn't eat the one I wanted. Yeah. 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 That's a drag. Well, if you were to create one then from the bottom up, take take a second if you have to and really focus in because this is important. Okay. And you're from well, Kansas City. It can be a po' boy that has smoked meat on it. Yeah, you know, there's I mean, nothing against that. I've gotten really good at smoking baby back ribs. Really? Kansas we should have been talking style. about this the whole time then. Kansas Let's City talk style. Let's talk about food now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a huge barbecue fan, so I guess, you know, I do. It's hard to say. Let me think. Let me think. What do I get from Arthur Bryant's in Kansas City? I like their sausage with their sauce. I, I'd make Is that a some, beef sausage or a pork sausage? It's a pork sausage. Okay. I'd make some type of collaborative Kansas City, New Orleans mashup. Okay. That would probably only be good to me. I don't know. Like, <laughs> it might only be good to we're me. We're pretty open-minded if you're going to put it on French bread. Yeah, Anything goes, you, you can't know? go wrong with French bread. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I like maybe a burn ends. Ooh. I'm getting excited now. Um, well, what would you, would you dress it? Would there be any kind of lettuce or like a... I can't figure out if that would be good or not. Because... Not with lettuce. I, I just meant like... Because standard dress in New Orleans is, uh, you know, lettuce, tomatoes, pickles, mayonnaise. I know? think like, people are going to be listening to you and they're going to be saying, she's not even describing a po' boy anymore. She's describing a completely different sandwich. That's a, that is totally fine. Because we had Sam Kraft on here uh, and he explained a very very particularly awesome po' boy, which I think would be great. And I'm going to butcher it if I try and say it right. <laughs> but it was basically every type of swamp animal you can find, Ooh. you know, alligator and frog legs, you know, whatever. <laughs> just just keep stacking them on top. I like alligator a lot. Like, okay. I, I dig alligator sausage, too. Yeah. I mean, it, that, that's a winner, right? Alligator, alligator sausage, sausage is phenomenal. Fully yeah. dressed with, like, crystal hot sauce. Oh, yeah. They have that at Guy's. You can get that there. I know. And crystal hot sauce, obviously, is the best local hot sauce. It is. Yeah. I always have some. Well, at the okay. Ready. I mean, you can probably mix. This is talking way too much about food. I don't know. <laughs> I'm getting really Pete hungry. Pete stood up in the back, so I'm getting nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um... um Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Uh, I, I very much appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. For having, you know, giving us the opportunity to see you perform here at Tipitina's. For anyone who hasn't seen it already, I guess, on Tipitina's.tv, uh, stellar performance. Thank you so much for real. But there is one thing also, aside uh -oh. from the po' boy conversation, <gasps> you don't leave empty handed. We give, we give everyone <laughs> a, uh, a parting gift. It is a certificate suitable for framing. Uh. Um, so this is yours for Yay. keeping. Okay. Um, you can do whatever you want with it, but thank it's you. suitable for framing. So feel free to buy a frame to put that in. Yeah. It's eight and a half I, by 11, so it's standard size. I might have one perfect for 
for that, actually. Well, there you go. Thank you that so much. That way you can remember this forever. Yeah, go ahead and read the caption. That's the best we part. We hereby certify that you, Samantha Fish, are officially awesome for being interviewed on this day, September 8th, 2020, for absolutely no monetary compensation whatsoever. Congratulations, and you're welcome. And you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet. Thank it, you so it much. It is. I, it's just a funny thing that we started doing. Um, thank you so much again, Samantha Fish. What, what's the website or whatever you can say for people to contact you? Uh, SamanthaFish.com. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Uh, WildHeartRecords.com, if you're interested in stuff like that. Uh, you can find me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I guess I'm on TikTok now. I should probably get on that. <laughs> Uh, are we allowed to get on that anymore? I don't know. I, I, don't I think know. so. It's not banned yet. Yeah. As, well, of, as of this date. If it's not banned yet, come and find me. Mm. And yeah, that's pretty much all I got. Well, thank you so much again, ladies and gentlemen, Samantha Fish. Thank you so much to Tipitinas for allowing us to use the venue. Thank you so much to Nugs.net for the use of the equipment. Uh, I hope everyone tunes into Tipitinas.tv to see all the great action that we have going on. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to the great Pete Jones in the back doing lights and sound, to Tan Tan the Man Man upstairs doing the camera edits, and to Nick Logan, who is also doing the final editing, executive producing, um, and whatever other title he wants to go ahead and put on the credits there. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Samantha Fish. Thank you. Virtual clink. Oh. Clink. clink. I'm almost done. Yeah, so yeah. let me have some more. Mm. Thank you again. Seriously. My I pleasure. appreciate it. Woo. I know it's been a long day. No, man. Thank you. Mm. And um, you guys are you guys have been wonderful. I really appreciate it all. Whew. That that's I hope I hope that didn't seem too long. That was actually no.